Hello Vinyl community! I should be working right now, but one of our cats has the tendency to fall asleep on my on my chair um, in my working room and uh, well, I don't have the heart to remove the poor thing, so I let her sleep and drop a VC video instead. So um, I've been listening to music the last two or three days and um, well, I always listen to music, so um, I kept the stack here before I put it back into the shelves behind me and here and um, so let's start with uh, some very interesting albums that uh, um, ended up on my turntable in the last two or three days now this one I've already shown somewhere last year I think it's uh, Ramshackled by Mr. Alan White um, this is one of those five uh, famous slash infamous albums that the Yes members have produced uh, in 1976 and 77. Five solo albums uh, instead of a Yes studio <laughs> album. And um, yeah, for me, this has always been one of my favorites uh, from this batch. And um, it's most definitely one of the most underrated albums that I've ever encountered. Because this record is insanely good. It's fascinating and fantastic from the beginning to the end. There is a quite a spectacular atmosphere on it. Um, there are strong sort of jazz fusion type passages combined with uh, psychedelic uh, parts and uh, a lot of Latin rhythms and um, passionate soul melodies and so on. It's great singing, great uh, keyboard playing here and um, yeah now that does not uh, change the fact that this is one of the worst rated albums you can imagine. I mean this got bad reviews when it came out in 1977. The press has butchered this record and uh, if you're looking today it hasn't changed that much um, but um, yeah I mean some platform like All Stars still uh, rates this with two stars which uh, probably uh, demonstrates uh, my personal uh, dislike for all these influencers and all these uh, tastemakers of, of art uh, I've never liked them and um, this is a uh, good proof why they suck most of the time because this is a wonderful record from beginning to the end I said that already but there are just no fillers every of these songs is really great and uh, it has been called a hodgepodge album that it doesn't stick to a certain genre well you can call it hodgepodge I call it eclectic so uh, <laughs> here you go this is a record I can truly recommend to uh, everyone who wants to explore something that's highly interesting. I mean, as I said, I like every song here. Um, this is really a great one. Yeah, so I would give it five stars if I would be rating these albums. Excellent record, outstanding musicianship, um, some great musicians. Um, even one uh, guest appearance by John Anderson uh, on one of the songs. So, um, yeah, if you abandon a certain preconception about the fact that... Um, yeah, because the reason why it was rated so bad, it all comes back to the one point that it was recorded by Alan White. Alan White was the drummer of Yes at the time. And there was this general expectation that if Alan White makes a solo album that it has to be some prog rock. It was not proggy at all and people hated it for that and that's kind of an absurd notion for me to be honest. Um, so um, yeah, this is the ultimate record to be rediscovered and explored I think. So next one. The well, next one I can imagine has been uh, shown on VC uh, quite a lot. I haven't seen it anywhere but I can imagine because it's that uh, type of uh, uh, record. So I'm talking about um, L'Enfant Assassin des Mouches by Jean-Claude Vanier. 
Now, Jean-Claude Vanier is a uh, avant-garde composer with uh, strong ties to sort of a jazzy, uh, jazzy 60s uh, music. Um, it's actually a bit difficult just to pin him down. Um, probably I would have to look him up somewhere and start to study his uh, uh, musical biography to kind of understand where he comes from and why the music sounds as it sounds. Now, if you listen to the album, you really can't get a precise feel of um, what he represents. So I remember years ago when I listened for, to this for the first time, I was a little bit confused. I was thinking that he's a bit of a charlatan because uh, I mean there are all these avant-gardistic moments that suddenly kick in and uh, you kind of have a hard time to understand what motivates uh, those artistic decisions. But um, that being said, it is the kind of album that has a tendency to grow on you despite the fact that it has a very complicated French title, L'Enfant Assassin des Mouches. Um, and uh, now, of course, uh, this record, of course, this record uh, came out uh, shortly after this one that probably everybody knows. Now, um, you could almost think of these two albums as some kind of a companion pieces if you wanted to, because uh, Vanier had the... Uh, because Vanier had uh, worked with Serge Gainsbourg on this one. I assume that uh, when uh, Serge Gainsbourg um, started to get this album together, Histoire de Melodie Nelson, um, that he had probably a batch of songs so that he could play on the piano and sing to them. And uh, it was uh, Jean-Claude Vanier that kind of came in and uh, started to create all these fascinating arrangements that made this album so famous. So um, um, this album here came one year after that, I think. I assume this was 1972, maybe. But did it really? Or am I just... Um, yeah, 1972 indeed. Now, um, of course, this is a um, reissue, a rather famous reissue by Finders Keepers um, that came out a couple of years ago. Yeah, so, um, I mean, um, there is, I mean, how does it sound? This is a sort of a mixture of psychedelic rock and uh, orchestral music and... Uh, it's very jazzy in some parts, and uh, um, but you never you never get a chance to kind of pin it down to a particular genre. But it has a sort of a late sixties feeling about it, sort of this French yeah yeah sound. But at the same time, it can be very very serious and very uh, suddenly a very disturbing. I mean, there are very disturbing moments on this record. So um, yeah, that's great music for. For uh, the uh, sophisticated sound chasers, um, and probably should not be missing in a good uh, vinyl collection, at least if you are into that kind of sound. Um, it's more or less an, uh, an uh, well, what I'm trying to say, uh, it's more or less an instrumental album, but there are sort of vocal passages. I mean, there's even. Um, some great, uh, strong, jazzy music that suddenly morphs into a beautiful um, choir piece. And um, so, some very strong moments here. Uh, I think uh, this is very legendary uh, music uh, and um, quite an amazing record. So, Jacques Lovanier, L'Enfant Assassin des Mouches. Yeah, I worked a while on that title. <laughs> so next one. Uh, next one is another legendary record that uh, should not be forgotten. And I'm talking about Space Hymns by Ramesses. And again, I'm pretty sure this has been shown uh, a couple of times on VC before. Um, I assume that at least, because uh, this is although also a little bit stuff of legends. So Ramesses was a British musician called Barrington Frost 
And together with his wife Selket, uh, he created this record, uh, one of two albums he made. Uh, he died very, very uh, young, I think it was in 1978 maybe. So uh, there are only two records uh, by Ramesses. And uh, by now this has become a real sort of a cult uh, album. So, so yeah, the, sim so the sound is a bit folky uh, with a certain late 60 vibe, but um, very psychedelic uh, mixed with with avant-gardistic moments and uh, but at the same time there's always this uh, strange subliminal originality to it the kind you would have probably experienced with uh, with uh, what David Allen and Gong for example sort of this unique handwriting it's a completely different kind of music here um, compared with Gong um, sort of less proggy and uh, much more folky but it's very intriguing yeah the other interesting part um, are the musicians playing on this record so um, because you have like Kevin Godley here and Lowell Cream and uh, Eric Stewart so basically everyone on this record later went on to be 10cc and uh, in a sense this is a kind of a proto 10cc <laughs> record um, yeah, so um, it's an, this came out on Vertigo and um, um, it's actually a bit expensive if you, if you want to find it somewhere on Discogs. Um, this is actually not even uh, one of those really expensive uh, super first editions that uh, came out with this uh, huge uh, cover that you could kind of unpack. Um, so of course early Roger Dean uh, sleeve design. Um, this here is a uh, German ratio probably from some uh, I would assume late 70s um, but still even that uh, was actually a little bit uh, pricey which I usually try to avoid but from time to time I just uh, bite the bullet and spend the money. So a great record very interesting sound, a uh, little little whimsical. Um, I mean, the 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 sound engineering is a little bit awkward, but uh, in an interesting and original way, it's quite fun to listen to it. So the next record um, I've been listening to um, is something quite special in my collection uh, for a particular reason. It's the only album ever recorded by Dirk and Lorenz. And uh, this is a country rock or country or country folk album. And um, you must understand that I've never been interested in country music. And uh, to be honest, I don't know anything about it. If you ask me names, one or two really famous country musicians, I would know. Uh, really, I have no connection to it. I mean, Dolly Parton maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, uh, it just never was my cup of tea. That being said... When I, I mean, this was a sort of a blind uh, pick for me. Uh, I just kind of liked the cover and I thought, well, it's a crate with sort of a two euro record, so why not give it a try? So when I came home, I put it on my turntable. This was like two or three years ago. And after 20 seconds, I realized that I have indeed purchased the country album. And... Um, it was definitely not a letdown. This is a wonderful record. Um, it's a mystery to me why these guys only recorded this one record. And um, you have, I mean, there's everything here. You have a wonderful, soulful moment, moments combined with sort of a uh, funky vibe and uh, psych elements and great orchestrations. And uh, it's all kind of spiced up with Latin Cuban grooves in some moments. This is a brilliant country record. It's the kind of a country music that um, uh, gives you goosebumps, I think. So um, if you don't know this one, just look into it, give it a try. It's an interesting album if you look at the genesis of this of this record. This is, uh, these two guys are Canadians that wrote this music as far as I have heard in Greece, it's been recorded in London 
and the first label that released it was in Germany. So um, that's quite strange, isn't it? Um, this came out as a double, uh, as a as a gatefold sleeve. Um, so um, you won't find this record on Spotify, um, but maybe on YouTube. If you want to give it a try, you can have a listen on some of the tracks. Um, I recommend a track called Dancing for the Captain's Pleasure and a song called Joshua. Check those two out and um, tell me what you think. But I think this is a brilliant record and uh, it's a record that has even uh, impressed someone like me who has basically no experience or knowledge with country music. Um, and um, that can mean a lot, probably there is still hope for me and in time I will discover other interesting country records. Who knows? So I have one more album here in my small stack and uh, that's another beautiful uh, record to explore and to discover. It's the self-titled album by Yellow Dog that came out in 1977 or 76 maybe. Uh, I think 7. Um, now this is a British rock band that uh, created this quite amazing uh, funky rock with a rather American feel to it. I mean this is a very sophisticated and very cool music actually. I guess if you like a band like Steely Dan then uh, this is kind of the direction even though I'm not saying they sound the same. Um, this music is sort of a little more rock driven, a um, little more, yeah, I'm a little more psychedelic induced, if you could say that. Um, there is some great playing by Jim Horn on this record, who, I mean, who played with Sinatra and um, who's a saxophone and flute player. So um, they used him on both instruments here. <laughs> Yeah, there is Gary Conway drumming here, who later became the drummer of Jethro Tull, of course. There is even Johnny Van Derrick on this record, who was back in the day quite a quite a prominent uh, session violinist that worked on dozens and dozens of movie soundtracks and worked with people like Henry Mancini. So um, this is quite a brilliant record. There are really some wonderful songs on it. Uh, I have actually only good things to say about it. Again, um, if you want to kind of check it out, um, probably again not on Spotify, um, but it might be somewhere on YouTube. Um, the two tracks I would recommend uh, are certainly um, a track called The Green Lizard and a track called City Bird. Check out those two and again, tell me if you like it. So um, this is uh, Yellow dog. Yeah, that's it for now. Um, that's what I've been listening yesterday mostly, and um, um, I will continue this another day. And um, the turntable is always spinning. So um, have a nice day and um, goodbye. <laughs>